Master Tavern Keeper's History of the Old World. So, that was the end of Lady Macdeath, Banquo, the Treeman, and Fergus McEwman, then. But, uh, what about the heirs, Prince Donalbane, and the clan laird, Julia McEwman? Ah, oh, well, down in the fetid depths below the latrines, where Donalbane had fallen, the prince was struggling to drag himself out of the feculent wet brown pit at its heart. The broken arrow protruding from his thigh was causing him immense pain with every movement, you see. But uh, in spite of this, he had just about gotten himself free when a voice called out to him from the rafters. It was Julia McEwman. Donald Bain, at last, the time has come for you to pay for our father's sin. For by getting me out of wedlock, then denying that we are kin. Macdeath robbed me of my chance to kill our father and avenge my mother, but I can still take the lives of his sons, cut the thread of each brother. Och, join the queue, she dog. There's nothing special about you. My father must have spawned more bastards than I've had balls of hot stew. <sighs> lies, 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 brother and wise to stoke my ire it'll only mean you'll suffer more before your funeral pyre and with that indignant rage coursing through her veins she leapt down into the stinking sludge her mace held high <laughs> the throne is mine Donald Bean only you and my death remain for your brother lies dead below throat cut still bound in Monaco and chain she dog, I'll have your murderous head. And with that, Donald Bain lunged at Julia, the Malta's falchion he wielded, striking at the murderess again and again and again with unthinking fury, each time either barely parried away by her mace or impacting on her rapidly splintering shield. The raw power and ferocity of his attacks forced her down onto one knee and, under the rain of blows, she began to sink into the thick, foul, fecal filth that surrounded them. But at that very moment that it seemed like her defences were about to crumble, another figure splashed into the shippet beside Dumblebane. It was Julia's bodyguard, Hugo Yorickson. Prince Donald Bean, don't think I've forgotten that you called me a wallet. You should have known that to insult me like that was nothing less than folly. <coughs> and with that, he hacked off Donald Bean's sword arm with his double-handed axe, and the air tumbled back down into the filth. The Malta's falchion still gripped tightly by Donald Bean's severed hand as it scattered away to land in a particularly foul wet patch and slowly sink into the stinking muck. And now it's time to slice your gut till it shows red. And then hack you up until you're dead. And then the two began laying into the fallen prince with mace and axe until Donald Bain's body was naught but a bloody pulp. <laughs> There, that is enough. You're clearly in distress. Die now, but know your kingdom belongs to my fair mistress. Boil your head, your wool. Hugo felt a pang of angry fire flare through him, and he finished off the dying Donald Bain with an axe blow to his neck, decapitating the mauled and mutilated prince. By the gods, Donald Bain's end was a lot less poetic in reality than uh, compared to the version I saw on the stage. 
Yeah, yeah, it most certainly was a bloody death. But uh, this, of course, is the uh, reality of war. War is suffering. Indeed, it is common for those uh, doing the fighting to suffer horrendous injuries and brutal ends. And uh, even if they come back through unscathed, their minds are also oft fractured and broken by all they've seen, felt and had to do. Even those on the uh, periphery of the fighting suffer. They lose their homes, their livelihoods, their families, their way of life and even their land. There is little good in war for the uh, common man. Indeed. The only ones who gain anything by war are those tyrants on their thrones. Those who order their warriors onto distant battlefields to die. And what do these mighty leaders gain? Political power? Standing? Popularity? Access to resources? Poultry, ephemeral things, compared to the lives of the lost, at least in uh, my estimation. Oh, yeah, yeah, most assuredly. Where that it was different. Ah, well, fingers crossed. Perhaps one day it will be, if enough of us do our part. Oh, fine words, but uh, anyhow, we are near the end now. Shall we continue with our tale? Ah, yes. Forgive our interruption, Cedric. Please, lead us through the uh, final confrontation. Ah, oh, it'll be my pleasure. But uh, just one more word on the uh, death of Donald Bain. There was a witness. As the bloody prince lay there, Yorickson's axe swinging for his neck, his eyes fell upon the great hole in the roof above. He could see the cloudy sky, stark and white, but against it, at that very moment, a pair of small eyes, set within a bald head, came into view. Eyes that the prince knew very well, for they belonged to the wizard, Murgray. Unfortunately, Murgray was uh, too late to save the prince, but at least he knew the culprits, and soundly swore that they would pay for their vile deed. Back outside, Macdeath was fighting the last of the clansmen of Clan McEwman. But although their blades slashed and stabbed at him, not a single wound had he suffered. Ah, you fools! No man or woman born can harm me. And with the last great heave of his blade, Macdeath cut down the last of the clansmen, only to find himself facing Dart, the Earl of Harkness, two of his knights, the knight John Quickshire, and his squire, Sandra Pangle. You couldn't beat me. No man of woman born can kill me. It is fortunate that I, the Earl of Harkness, was not born then. Rather, I was from my mother's womb, untimely. Ripped. And it is fortunate to die. Sandra Pangle, I'm not a man at all. So as I too might be your doom. And that is fortunate that I, Quickshire, am with these two. Sandra! But as Quickshire was speaking, Macdeath plunged his blade into the night squire and dealt her a near mortal blow, although not killing her. Quickshire moved to catch her as she collapsed and Macdeath took the opportunity to behead the knight as his back was turned. Quick show! The last two knights of Harkness immediately attacked Macdeath, but he cut them down with two effortless sword strokes, leaving Dart the last man standing. Macdeath, you foul snake in the grass, face me and fight, and it'll be your blood I'll be cleaning off my blade this very night. We'll see. But I'm happy to pay the soldier's price. Death. I have lived a full life as a king, a fiend, a husband, and above all of these, a man. So I'm happy to prove that I'm still a man by fighting 
and dying like wood. You're no man, you're no better than a cloaked murderer in the dead of night. And at the end of a noose would be the best end for you instead of a fair fight. And so it was in the centre of Castle Runcine, a light drizzle falling from the sky, the courtyard strewn with piles of dead and dying, and the castle itself on fire, that Dart, the Earl of Harkness, and Macdeath, the King of East Albion, faced each other in hand-to-hand combat. Oh, yeah, yeah, now this is more like it. Was it like this in the uh, stage version too, Master Tavernkeeper? Ah, uh, yes, indeed it was. But please, Cedric, continue. I am eager to hear how this played out in reality. Come at me, you supper. Come at me. Oh. But my gut tells me I should avoid thee, for both our sakes. My soul is too much charged with the blood of your knights and allies already. Ah, I have no more words. My voice is in my sword. Thou bloodier villain than terms can give thee out. See, we are well matched. I will not fight with thee. Then yield, coward, and live to be the show and gears of the time. We'll have thee as our rarer monsters are. Painted on a pole and under it, here may you see the tyrant. I will not yield to kiss the ground before Donald Bean's feet, and to be baited with the rabble's curse. Though Clinty's would be come to Runzanane, and thou opposed, being of no woman born, yet I will try the last. Before my body, I throw my warlike shield, lay on Earl of Harkness, and damned be him that first cries, Hold! And with that, the two fought. Macbeth thrust and parried, matching Dart's own sword swings and lunges. But the knight and his own magic flaming sword had the edge over Macbeth and his own talking blade. Sword struck sword again and again, until at last the earl landed a mortal blow on the king cutting him from neck to rib cage. Macdeath fell to his knees, blood filling his lungs and robbing him of speech. But it was at this very last moment that Julia McEwman and Hugo Yorkson came running out of the latrines towards the dueling pair. Dart! Dart! Is he dead? Did you kill Macdeath? And at her words, Dart sheathed his blade and pointed at the stricken king struggling to breathe. Julia immediately grabbed Macbeth's crowned helmet from his head and kicked him over so he fell face down into the wet mud to reveal the keys to the treasury below. I'll take these. And she then raised her mace and brought it crashing down towards Macbeth's head. But the Earl of Harkness swiftly blocked the fatal blow with his sword and stared at the clan laird, eyes wide in disbelief. What are you doing there, lass? These do not belong to you. It is to the heir of King Dunko that these things are due. But that is me, for I am the daughter of Dunko and Morag McEwman, born out of wedlock then discarded, treated as less than human. The treasury keys will prove my claim, and for within are her love letters, and will raise me to the highest name above all of my betters. <laughs> this is no time to jest. Where is Donald Bean? But the answer that came was not what he expected, as Murgray the magician emerged from the latrines, his robes dripping with fecal waste, 
and, holding aloft Donald Bean's severed head. <coughs> Don't trust the she-dog. Her and the outlander have murdered the prince. But before Dark could react, Julia smashed the earl across his face and Hugo Jorgsen swung his double-handed axe into the back of their former ally, causing him to collapse to the ground. Oh, what treachery is this? What infamy? If you were not a woman, I would strike at thee. Wished? I wouldn't bile your head, you chauvinist walloper. And at that, she grabbed the Earl's fallen flaming blade and thrust it through his chest, killing him instantly. Hugo began to laugh, but it caught in his throat when he saw another blade suddenly hurtle through the air and pierce Julia McEwen's chest, ending its preternatural journey protruding from her ribcage. His fear and surprise was doubly so when he saw that the blade was none other than Donald Bean's old two-handed sword. Hugo looked about him in a white panic, expecting to see the dead Donald Bean's ghost looming over him. Instead, though, he saw Mere Grey stood still, his fingers and arms gesticulating as if he was pulling the strings of a marionette. And with every movement, he saw the hilt of the blade embedded in his mistress's back, jerking and trying to free itself. You probably won't be there. I'll have you hit for this. And he left the wounded Julia to charge the occupied magician. Julia didn't react at all. Instead, she simply stared down at the weapon protruding from her chest in utter disbelief. Mere Grey saw Yorickson coming and drew his dagger, but it did him little good, as with a single blow, Yorickson's double-handed axe cleaved him down the centre from the crown of his head to the depths of his gullet. <laughs> Meanwhile, though, Julia McEwen had dropped to her knees, her own newly acquired crown rolling from her grasp to come to rest in the same muddy puddle as the dying Macdeath lay. The dying king gazed upon it, hatefully, as his last breaths sputtered up blood into the dirt-thick water. He did not die alone, though, for it was into this self-same spot that Julia McEwen too collapsed, and, as each exhaled their last, their eyes settled upon each other, the blood-splattered crown of East Albion lying between them, its cursed crenellations mocking their murderous ambitions. With Mirgray dead at his feet, Yorkson turned and returned to his mistress's side, but was dismayed at the sight that greeted him. She was dead, as was Macdeath, each with a hand on the crown of dirt that lay between them. Ah, t'was surely folly to have followed this path. All we found is death, fear, and laugh. Albion be damned be better off at sea. Opportunities are plenty there for someone the likes of me. And with that, he stared up at the burning keep and shook his head before closing the still open eyes of the dead Julia and taking the keys to the treasury from the dead body of Macdeath. No one knows what happened to both the treasure of Macdeath and Yorickson after that, but uh, neither are mentioned again in the annals of the truth sayers. And so that, then, is the tale of the tragedy of Macbeth, and the end of the reign of kings in East Albion. Oh, yeah, yeah, my goodness. Uh, but, uh, Master Alchemist, I do have a question. What of Sandra Pangol, the uh, poet and squire of the uh, dead knight errant? You said she was wounded, but uh, not killed. Ach, you've an eye for the details there, Heinrich. You're quite right, indeed. Well, the story goes that she awoke the next day outside the walls of the burnt out castle, and she was atop the horse of her former master, Quickshire, whom uh, he'd uh, left tied up in the glade near the entrance of the secret tunnel. 
her wound had been bound, and, strapped to the saddle of the horse, was the dented and blood-stained armour and weapons of Quickshire himself. But uh, she had no recollection of how she got there, nor who had helped her. That said, it is believed that it was the uh, the ghost of Quickshire himself. But uh, who knows if that's true? Oh, uh, but uh, I did mention that Albion is a mysterious place, didn't I? <laughs>